Hey everyone, this is Martian Lewandowski and you're watching the Turn VC Show. Turn VC is all about going places, having fun, and interviewing some great guests with different backgrounds that turn venture capital investors. Today we are in pretty cloudy Amsterdam and we are interviewing Jacqueline van der Ende, who is the founder and CEO of Carbon Equity. Let's check it out. Cheers. Cheers, Jacqueline. Nice meeting you. Mm. All right, so welcome to the Turn VC Show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's, it's amazing to have you. Um, so I know that um, you've had a really international upbringing because your dad used to be a consultant or an engineer for... Engineer for, for Shell. Shell, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, how did it shape your perspective on life and business and um yeah you know, did you ever consider um a career of a globe trotting secret agent or <laughs> or it was like entrepreneurship win the day all the time it's a it's a fair question i think for me uh having grown up very internationally is really some of yeah it's a very rich thing i really consider it one of the biggest gifts that i the first five years of my life i grew up in australia and then later, four years in Syria and Damascus. Right. Completely different worlds. Right, yeah. And then later in the Netherlands and many other countries. And yeah, you just grow up with a much bigger perspective that life is very different in different uh, corners of the world. Mm -hmm. So I did grow up kind of wanting to be a globe-trotting secret agent, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think for a long time, I wanted to be a bit similar to my dad. He was uh, trained as a geological engineer. And so for a long time, I thought of becoming like a geoscientist. Uh, yeah. Not so much because I was into the science, but because I wanted to spend time in the mountains and exploring right. the world. Uh, but I ultimately pivoted uh, to entrepreneurship. Yeah. Amazing. And I know that in between your studies, once you were already back in the Netherlands, um, you did this special project that was um, like organizing Fashion Week in uh, Kyrgyzstan. Yes. That sounds like planning a beach party in Antarctica, actually. <laughs> and uh, so how did that come about? And uh, do you have any memorable moments or experience that you can share with us? And, you know, uh, was there any fashion faux pas that still makes you laugh? <laughs> yes, there was a lot of faux fashion there. Um, well, I uh, was a student working at Isaac, which is one of the world's largest student organizations. And one of the main things that they do is they organize international student exchanges. Uh -huh. And I wanted to go to the least known place on the planet. And I had in my mind uh, that that was uh, Siberia because I grew up in Syria and people always mistook that for Siberia. So people yeah. always thought like it was very cold or something right, where I lived right, in Syria. Right. And as I looked at the map and I saw Siberia and then under Siberia, I saw Kyrgyzstan and then under Kyrgyzstan or under I saw Kazakhstan and then like in a small corner of Kazakhstan, I saw this very little country called Kyrgyzstan and I thought I know nothing about this country I know absolutely nothing so um, yeah so I arranged an internship and there was only one internship in Kyrgyzstan mm -hmm. it was only one only one okay <laughs> and you got it yes yes and uh, this internship was with the International Kyrgyzstan Fashion Week all right and I knew less about fashion than I knew about Kyrgyzstan how did you pull it up <laughs> Well, I took a train. This was one of the bigger adventures of my life. I, I went to Moscow uh -huh. and well, there were very few flights to Kyrgyzstan. It was expensive and it was also quite dangerous because all the airlines of Kyrgyzstan were blacklisted in the right. European Union. Right, so I right, figured right, I'd right, go right, by right. train. <laughs> and this was an 80 hour train ride from, Kyrgy from Moscow to Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. And I was traveling by myself. I posted on the Lonely Planet website, look, I'm going to go to Kyrgyzstan, my train. Does anybody have any tips? Yeah. 
And then I got all these alarm messages of like, don't do it, like it's dangerous. Uh, but I couldn't change my ticket, so ultimately I went by myself. And it was an amazing experience. It was 80 hours, three and a half days in the- in 80 the, hours, yes. eight zero, okay, Eight okay. zero, no shower. Uh, we were, I was traveling third class because that was the most <laughs> safe option. Okay. So there were maybe like a hundred people in this wagon with uh -huh. Like uh, they were bringing uh, fridges and livestock and like everything from Moscow to uh, Central oh, Asia man, and people from yeah from Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and they were so so friendly. They fully adopted me, gave me food throughout the travels, and so it was the opposite of dangerous. It was a really mm. cool experience. What kind of food did you have? Oh, uh, so do you remember? Yes, all kinds of chicken dishes, uh -huh. uh, stews, and uh, pierogies, like sort of like these uh, dumplings. With, dumplings, correct? Yes, all kinds of things. Oh, okay, I got. And then I finally got to uh, Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Eighty hours, no shower, with my backpack, <laughs> like sort of you know these zipper pants. Right, 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 right. <laughs> use. And then I got picked up by Miss Kyrgyzstan International. And really? Yes. That's so cool. <laughs> and she looked like she had this mini skirt, like massive stiletto heels, her hair styled onto, onto, onto here. And she looked at me like, what is this wrong delivery coming from <laughs> backpacker pants? Yeah, she, she really thought like, this is, this is, this is a no-go. But yeah, so then I spent uh, a couple of months there supporting the Fashion Week. Sounds good. So after that, um, you go back to the Netherlands. Yeah. And um, I know that um, while you were studying, you founded this organization called um, The Clinic Consultant. Correct, yeah. So what inspired you to do this? And, um, you know, uh, how did you manage or what did you learn uh, while navigating this um, early stage, uh, early days of your entrepreneurship? I, um, yeah, I came across the idea because I, as a student, went to a lot of these business courses of McKinsey and Boston Consulting Group and yeah. Strategy Consulting Business Courses. And at the same time, I was working in the smallest cinema of Amsterdam right. called the Uitkijk. We were working there with 15 students and all of them were film students. Mm -hmm. And at some point, my friends, film students, wanted to start a company and they couldn't figure out uh, what to do. Yeah. So they sat with me, six people, like, and they asked me, Jackie, can you give us advice on how to start the company? And in two hours, we found the solution that they had been looking for for six months. Yeah. And I walked out the door and then the idea of the kleine consultant, the small consultant, fell from the sky with the name and all. It was, I immediately, I envisioned, I envisioned basically the organization that it's today that on one hand you have students who are smart and can give very good strategic advice based on data analysis to startup companies, small companies, NGOs, anybody who needs strategic advice but cannot afford to hire McKinsey. Right. On the other hand, you have big consultants who coach every project of the small consultants. And for the big consultants, the kleine consultants are a very important talent pool. Yeah. And then our customers get free or affordable strategic advice. So we've helped uh, immigrants, for example, start up their, uh, their first business. But we've also advised an aerospace company on commercial space travel. So. Yeah. Like all across the economy, we support yeah, hundreds of small businesses with strategic advice. And now there are a few hundred consultants, clinical consultants, 15 years old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what I learned, I learned that I uh, love entrepreneurship. I think the experience of going from a split second idea to a thriving organization is, uh, is amazing. And I learned that uh, what is most important in building a sustainable organization is hiring really good people. Right. And the reason why the Kleine Gesundheit has become so successful is because we were always super critical in hiring the very best students that were in the industry who then continued the Kleine Gesundheit for many years to come. That sounds amazing. Um, all right, let's enjoy the location. Let's enjoy our beer and um, let's move to the next one. <laughs> Cheers. All 
All right, uh, everyone, we are back uh, now being in a boat. Um, Jack Lane is our captain. <laughs> and it's the best way to see Amsterdam, as uh, Jack Lane claims. And I can't disagree with that. It's yeah, right. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I know that your first job was in private equity, but um, maybe not quickly, but after some time, you realized that, um, you know, you're like craving the startup world and you want to get back to the startups. And, um, and you know, like kind of going from investor to, to, to entrepreneur is like superhero changing uh, her, her um, suit into the superhero suit. <laughs> yes. And um, so speaking of that, like, so was there any particular moment when you decided to, you know, put on your cape and uh, and you went to, okay, I'm going to say to the world now one startup at a time. And you decided to, and you decided to change your password to startup 2014. Like, yeah, what, what was it the, what was the pivotal moment for that and uh, how did that come about? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't think it was like one moment. I Ever since I built the Knight and Gozilton, I really fell in love with entrepreneurship. And throughout the years working in private equity, I had a feeling that, you know, I was learning a lot, but I really, I really dreamt of being on the other side of the table. I want to be a builder and not just the financier or the investor. And uh, so I had already been telling my friends, like, you know, if next year I still work with P Capital, you really have to kick my ass to get out of the company because this is really what I want to yeah. do. And indeed, then in 2013, I changed my password so that I would remind myself every single day that I was logging into my laptop of my startup dream. Um, and then I just started telling people. And I believe that. You know, when you want something in life, you should say it out loud. Uh, you should tell people because then some people will, you know, be able to help you uh, reach uh, your goals. And so then somebody uh, told me about uh, this company called Rocket Internet and that they were looking for founders to right. build businesses for them. This is, by the way, a tricky part because this is where boats may come from the other side. So just kind of with float if that's we good. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So I got introduced to uh, to uh, to Rocket Internet, and yeah. they said, "Well, would you want to build us a company in the Philippines?" In the Philippines, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the Philippines. Yeah. Why not? Let's go. Yes. Yeah. I kind of. Well, initially, I he said, "Would you like to build a company abroad?" Yeah. And I thought, you know, I had this sort of image in my mind of going to Berlin or New York or Silicon Valley or something. Yeah. And stinky remembering and saying, how about the Philippines? And I was like, where is the Philippines? I had to Google it. And, uh, but I figured out he could surf there and they spoke English. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I felt I had nothing to lose. I was single at the moment. I was ready for an adventure. Sounds good. And uh, so I quit my job, and a month later, I was living in Manila. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so actually speaking about that, um, you kind of felt that you're more of a builder than yeah. an investor, right? And um, Yeah, hold on. Wait, sorry. This is uh, one section where it's she cannot... Also, this does a lot. Yeah, good. by the way, guys, if you hear that sound, we are running out of gas. Uh, we were just looking for the for a place that to put some fuel on. Uh, yeah, and we might get stuck mid water. That's my okay, main okay. Uh, challenge. So uh, we didn't manage to go that way, but we figured out the other way, which is even better because it's one of the coolest uh, cars in Amsterdam. Um, so next question, uh, Jack Wayne. I so you, you know, developed and scaled various different companies from uh, the Kaneko Southland to Lamuri to True Money and now uh, Carbon Equity. What's the, I want to say was the one thing, but it doesn't have to be one thing, but it was the one thing that, you know, gets you, gets you excited about, uh, you know, starting from companies from scratch and um, what challenges uh, have you encountered on encounter the way? For me, it's like an adventure. Like, way in the beginning, we spoke about whether I wanted to be like a globe-trotting secret agent. Yeah. Yeah, and 
I did want to be like a professional adventurer. I still think I would want to. Like yeah. If at some point I retire from entrepreneurship, I'd love to, I don't know, walk around the world or... Like, Explore the spy yeah, game. Yeah, be one of those unexplored places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, but startup is, founding a startup is very much an adventure. Like every day is different. You learn, there's no job in which you can learn more than in building a company. You have no idea what you're going to find. There are ups and downs all the time. It's super hard work, but it's also extremely rewarding when when you make it. Like when you actually build a company and you have, I don't know, a few dozen people or a few hundred people working at your company right. and you are adding value. And yeah. at some point, this company lives beyond you. And for me, that's, yeah, it's from a beautiful experience and a hard one, of course. And a car one, of course. That sounds amazing. And I know that um, after some time, you, you actually got an offer to join a venture capital firm, Big Capital, right? Yeah, correct. And um, you accepted the offer because Big is pretty cool fund. Yeah, very cool fund. Definitely. Um, but, <laughs> but after some time, you had this real realization that actually venture capital and you is not really a match made in heaven because you feel more as a builder yeah. than an investor. Yeah. Um, At least in this phase of my life. Okay. Yeah. What made you really realize that and how would you, like, what would distinguish the, you know, the builder and the investor in the startup world? Yeah, good question. I realized because when at peak I was speaking to all of these entrepreneurs and honestly, the main thought that I had was, I wish I were you. Like, I had that, I think, 20 times a week. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I felt like, well, I'm on the wrong side of the table. I want to build. And right. for me, look, both play an extremely important role in the innovation ecosystem, right? It's hard to build a startup without capital. And I think a lot of VCs not only bring capital, but also a lot of advice and experience, etc. But that's why I would rather be a venture capital investor, let's say in 20 years when I, we're just gonna make a turn here. <laughs> that's a sharp turn, guys. What child do you want? <laughs> it is a sharp turn. And we also see that we're gonna have some counter traffic, but let's see, so. I'll imagine so well. Um, Oh, we're good. Okay, so, um, yeah, both play an extremely important role, right, in the ecosystem, and I have a lot of respect for VCs. Right. But I get most energy from, yeah, from, from, from sales. I actually yeah. like sales. So I like having an idea, having a vision, and then, oh, it's like a big boat is coming our way. Oh, shit. <laughs> How will you make it? This is, uh, yeah. This is a more adventurous this is, boat ride yeah, than yeah, you had yeah, hoped exactly, for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, Jacqueline is so good. Right. Nice. Bofa. But how awesome is Jacqueline? Come on. <laughs> Everyone, come for Jacqueline. <laughs> it's not a rock yet, but let's go for Jacqueline. <laughs> <laughs> that is a bit crazy thing. Okay. <laughs> Back to venture capital and entrepreneurship. But I think, you know, my energy yeah. and I think my talents are in uh, ideation. Yeah. I constantly have business ideas yeah. uh, in pitching. I yeah. actually enjoy sales pitches or investor pitches. And I like the storytelling. You know, entrepreneurship is very much about storytelling. I like hiring people and I have a lot of experience uh, having hired a lot of very good people and also uh, a lot of not so very good people. So I really know what talent looks like. And yeah, so all of those elements, uh, I think are very much core to being a builder and being yeah. a CEO. And as an investor, I think what you need to be good at is having a macro view on like, you know, what's happening in the world. You yeah. need to have a thesis on yeah. like, what, what do I believe in? Right. And then you need to be extremely curious on wanting to learn uh, about everything. Um, but also, you need to have the space of mind to want to support founders, right? Because as an investor, you're ultimately in a supporter role. 
Right. And you're helping other people become successful. And to be very honest, and I wasn't there yet. I first want to be successful as an entrepreneur myself mm -hmm. before I pay it forward. Also because then I will have all of the experience on, you know, how do you internationalize your company? Like if you haven't done it before, for me, it's hard to be you know, an investor who advises uh, companies on what they should be doing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my route. Amazing. Um, let's enjoy the ride and um, get to the next location soon. <laughs>
So we're going to have much greener cities yeah. with fewer cars or micro mobility, electric solutions. We're going to have breathable air. That's what I envision. I think we will live in a world where my hope is that we enjoy greater quality over quantity. I think the past couple of decades have been about quantity and everybody wanting more. And I think now we're starting to recognize, oh, actually it's a good idea to invest in more expensive clothing if it doesn't uh, break in the next two months. Right. So quality, I think this is going to be the age of quality over quantity. Amazing. Um, great to hear that. I hope it's going to go this way. Um... Meanwhile, it's starting to rain. This is a very Dutch it's actually experience. To rain, yeah, to rain, and <laughs> this is going to be the last question. Yeah, during the rain. Hold on, I have an umbrella. Should we you use an umbrella? umbrella? <laughs> Here, nice. There we go. I got it. I got it. Yeah. So, thanks so much for answering all the questions so far. Um, I want to say that I've enjoyed the interview so much, and uh, it's such an inspiring um, interview that we've been having. And so. Speaking about your personal life a bit more, I know that you're um, an adventurer at heart and that you're also heavily married with your uh, wife, who's, by the way, from the Philippines. And uh, so I would like to ask, do you have any crazy adventure that you would like to share with us that, um, you know, takes a special place in your heart? Or, um, yeah, and um, how do you manage a work-life balance? Uh, well, work-life balance for me is a struggle. I'm uh, what you might call a workaholic. I like to uh, work a lot. It gives me a lot of pleasure and I just learn so much. Uh, but at the same time, you know, being married, being in any kind of relationship also requires you also, yeah, really invest in your relationship and in your presence. Uh, yeah. And that's not always, even, not always as easy uh, for my partner. Um, but I try to uh, especially unwind in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a really beautiful city, it's a great place to do business, but right. it's also a nice place to go for a walk or to see the water or uh, go for a bike ride, for example. So yeah. on the weekends, the thing that we really enjoy doing most is simply going for walks around a beautiful city. And that's a way that, um, yeah, I sort of unwind from work. I wake up very early in the morning, uh, typically at 5 a.m., uh, so that I can get some work done uh, before the day starts. Yeah. And as a result, I also you know, try not to work too much in the evening. So, I mean, it's more aspirational than I actually manage to do it, but I try in the evening when I come home really to be sense. present yeah. and to uh, keep my laptop shut. But at times I do squeeze in some emails somewhere. Amazing. Yeah. And what about the adventure part? Uh, <laughs> oh, my favorite adventures. adventures. Gosh, I'm blessed with so many adventures in my life. I uh, feel very privileged. But I mean, for me, one of the most beautiful countries in the world is Norway. Mm. It's like one of the best places really? that you can go hiking. The nature is the most spectacular I've seen all around the world. Uh, so I can highly recommend spend the summer in nature in Norway. Everyone, I've heard that Norway this time of the year is very beautiful. Yeah. You gotta go. Thanks so much. Jacqueline, uh, that was the... Wait, I have to first do that. That was the last question. Um, everyone, clap for Jacqueline. That's a wrap. Thanks yeah. so much. Amazing.